Hey guys, before we get into this week's uh, episode of the podcast, I'm super excited. Uh, the second editions of the Accountant's Guides are out, the Guide to IRS Collection and the Guide to Resolving Tax Debts. As you've heard from listening to the podcast, there's been no better time to launch your representation practice or take your existing practice to the next level. The books will, in a very economic way, help you do that. It, they literally walk you every step of the way, start to finish. They are designed to be very readable. There are case studies, exhibits, letters, everything that you would want right there at your fingertips, okay? And there's a special, when you go to get the books, when you purchase the hard copy books, you get the eBooks for free. So the moment you buy, you'll instantaneously have the eBook. All right, so you can get started right away. Go check, you know, click on the link, check that out, all right? So everyone, listen, um, I've gotten a lot of questions about tax rep, right? What is tax rep network? Is it worth joining? What tax rep network is, is an online community of those of us who really are working at building our practices, right? This is how Jeff and I basically built a $4 million practice in five years, all right? And we are helping the other members do just that. We've had the $100,000 challenge when we got more than 70% of our members over that. We're now helping them go to 250, 500, even a million. All right, there are three different levels of membership. Silver, if you're just interested in doing some of the training, all right, you can certainly get in on the silver membership. When you're ready to start taking cases and you wanna start consulting with us, that's where your gold membership is. Gold membership, you basically get everything. You get the books, you get the conferences, you get all the training materials, and you get access to the forum, to the other members, the monthly marketing calls, the monthly Q&A calls, the case study of the month, and also, again, you can consult with us. Then there's the Platinum membership. And the Platinum membership really is designed for members that, that who's, have elevated their practice to the point where they just need more access to us. And that really is all it is. The Platinum membership are for those folks that want to be able to get on a weekly call, want to come in here once or twice a year, integre, I mean, meaning Integreen and Sklar's, to actually do hands-on training with us, all right? So Platinum is really designed for members that have already crossed those, those, those thresholds that they had set and are now trying to take their practice to the next level. So whether you're silver, gold, or platinum, there's been no better time to do this. So go check out Tax Rep LLC. There'll be a link in the description to the podcast, and we hope to see you inside. Bye-bye. All right, guys, listen. I want to remind you, um, May 15th of this year is the full day criminal tax program, all right, at Quinnipiac Law School, whether you want to come in person or join us on the web, all right, it is eight hours, we bring in some of the top speakers from all over the country, friends of ours, people from the government, and uh, we are going to be walking you through what you need to know about criminal tax. So whether you're an attorney who wants to start doing this work, you're a CPA or EA who wants to get in in being involved in criminal cases because they're very lucrative, uh, or if you're unenrolled and this is simply an area that interests you, so when you do get your EA, you can start working toward that and adding this um, to part of your practice, like being a Covell accountant. Um, go check out that. The link is in the description. It's eight hours. There's the early bird special now is going on. So grab your seat while you can. The room sells out every year. I'm sure it will again this year. All right. And hopefully we'll see you on May 15th. Thank you everyone for tuning into this episode of the Tax Rep Network. Joining me this week is Brent Robertson. Brent is one of the founders of Fathom LLC, a consulting firm in West Hartford, Connecticut that I am now intimately involved with. A little more on that in a few minutes. They help leaders become better equipped, more connected, and applying effort where, efforts where it matters most. They help your employees know what they do matters and helps teams, teams become more effective. They can help you elevate yourself and your organization in the eyes of your clients and your community. Fathom's statement is, we reconnect people with what gives them their work meaning, what gives their work meaning and drives unprecedented performance. Now, that's the official stuff. The, <laughs> the actual reason, Brent's laughing, the actual reason that I am intimately familiar with Fathom is because Brent has helped me, 
All right. Now, if you were at the New England IRS Rep Conference, you've sort of heard this and you've actually seen Brent. Uh, we were on stage on the last panel together. But for those of you who couldn't join us, this all starts in my office. All right. I'll keep the story. I'll keep it short. But so it starts with my meeting with one of Brent's clients. We, we have a client in common. I'm helping uh, them. And in talking to Brent, beginning to realize what they do, uh, I begin to realize, you know, there's something here. Fast forward now a few months. I'm in my office on a Saturday morning. I call Brent, cell phone. Brent, who's stupid enough to pick up on a Saturday morning when he sees my number, <laughs> Um, you know, and I basically tell him, and, and Brent, I'm, I'm going to, you, this will probably ring a bell. I said, look, the law firm is growing by leaps and bounds. The tax rep community has tripled in size. My members are all hitting the hundred thousand dollar mark. Um, the books continue to sell unbelievably. The podcast following is built up. So if everything is so great, why am I so fucking miserable? <laughs> um, and, and what followed was a conversation and not just over the phone, it was a preliminary over the phone, but then us meeting and talking and forcing me and Jeff to begin rethinking not only what we were doing, but how we were doing it. All right. Um, and, um, and so everyone listening to Brent has come in, spoke with the entire firm and sort of help get us rowing in the same direction, as well as looking at kind of how we do what we do and why we do what we do. So aside from helping us, Brent, thanks for agreeing to come on the podcast and also do the, doing the conference. I just decided it was so great I would share you with everybody else, if that's okay. Oh, man, thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, so listen, I, you know, I, before we get into sort of the, the, the gory details of kind of how you helped us and how you guys do what you do, um, talk a little bit about the genesis of Fathom because you didn't always do this. Um, you know, in, in getting to know you, um, this sort of what I call mental health consulting, meaning <laughs> we're gonna avoid Eric throwing himself off the building. Um, you guys were sort of in a different space. Can you kind of walk people through how, what is Fathom and how you kind of got to where you are now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just, just even before there, just to sort of relieve, you know, the, the first, the opening to this conversation is organizations are nothing more than human constructs and service to human needs. And guess what human beings are? We're, unpredictable, emotional, erratic. <laughs> and, and so we can well, 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 take me, <laughs> me, well, are you suggesting that I can be emotional and erratic? Meaning I can call you today and tell you everything's great. And tomorrow I have a gun and I'm going to put it in my mouth. And there's something <laughs> wrong with that? Yeah. You know, so it's just like, we could just, let's everybody just take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're a mess. And, and the things we do, I mean, it's just messy. It's messy being human. Um, and as much as we've tried to strip as much humanity uh, out of organizations as possible to make them predictable and reliable, we can't help but bring the humanity back into it. So just an overall permission to relax, just relax. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Genesis of Fathom, you know, Fathom was born of uh, my business partner and I coming together and um, building what at the time was one of the premier digital marketing strategy firms. Um, you know, we're 15 years old, so we were, you know, coming in um, after the, the dot-com bust, um, but really still when, um, you know, enterprise digital and, and digital brand and those kinds of concepts were still fairly new um, and organizations were trying to find their way into a rapidly maturing, you know, technological and, and marketing environment. And we were very, very successful as a marketing firm. In fact, our headquarters were in downtown Hartford. Um, we had, you know, 35 employees about to hire a whole bunch more. And, you know, a couple things happened. One, the bigger the business got, uh, the more demands on us being business people, the more miserable <laughs> um, Dave and I became because it became about operating the business as opposed to what we loved, which was working with people to help transform their businesses. And of course, you know, 2008, the uh, economic uh, downfall happened. And so it, it became this perfect storm of like asking ourselves a question. I'm like, if we're going to work this hard, 
um, and um, you know we're going to deal with the consequences of the economy. Um, what are we doing that makes it worth it? And as a marketing company, what we were paid well for was building these beautiful and compelling stories to help organizations put their best foot forward. But in doing so, we also started asking questions to say, you know, is this organization actually prepared to live up to the story that we're creating for them? Have they done the, the work to be able to deliver on the experience that they're promising? And so we started asking big, hairy questions of our clients, and we found they were really struggling to answer them. Like, you know, well, well in service to what do you exist? Um, why are you doing these things? What, what is it you're driving toward? What is, it, what is this all about for you? You know, what are the values that you're trying to live up to as you run this organization? And so we would be helping these organizations figure out how to answer these questions. And when we found the answers for them, uh, with them, um, we saw that not only did they give us what we needed to do our job in creating these amazing stories and websites and brands, but they also catalyzed huge change within the organization itself. And we're like, hey, wait a minute, you know, we're doing all this heavy lifting just so that we can build their brand and build their website for free. <laughs> and it's having this transformative change on their organizations. What if that's kind of like what we did? And so we started to shift where we focused our attention, started to prototype a new kind of business that really focused on creating a change in the existence of our clients, not just putting a nice veneer of a good looking or good sounding story on top of them. When we started down this road, there really wasn't a name for what we were doing. Um, it was so brand new that you know, no one even know how to ask for it. It's really hard to sell something that people don't even know they need. Um, yep. So we named, we named it, we named the practice future design, um, which is really this practice of having more intentional say and influence on the future that you want. And um, over the next uh, few years, we um, took on a handful of significant clients to really prove this out. We actually hired a firm to go in and audit those organizations. And what they found after a couple of years time in taking on this uh, practice of future design, that there was radical change within the organizations and that the organizations were performing beyond the benchmark of what their history or what their industry said was possible across the board, whether they be an aerospace manufacturer, a nonprofit organization, someone in the technology space, et cetera, all of them were having the best years of their existence and were seen as the pioneers of their industry based on the kind of performance that was changing. We're like, holy cow, we're onto something. And that really began uh, what Fathom has become today, where leaders that either are dealing with conditions that they can no longer tolerate or have ambitions that are keeping them awake at night come to us to help them create these futures where their organizations can perform beyond that benchmark. You know, it, it's, um, and, and for the folks listening, um, you know, it, the reason I've, I've, I've so wanted to have, have you come on, Brent, for so long is because I get emails and, and through LinkedIn, social media, you know, the, these messages, and they all seem to be like, Eric, it's amazing what you're doing. You know, I can't believe, you know, how, how, you know, you do all of this. But those messages bother me a little bit because it's sort of like everyone loves the final product, but they don't know how the sausage gets made. And if you came here on a daily basis, it's a, uh, my life is a little bit more chaotic than it may seem. Um, mm. You know, and, and that, that the chaos that other folks who are listening, the accountants and attorneys who are listening to this, um, who are like, wow, you know, how do those guys manage this? Um, we were very much out of control. And, and one of the things I wanted to talk to you about and tell people, when we first started talking, you asked me a question uh, on that call on that Saturday morning. And I remember thinking to myself, what a stupid question. Of course, you know, and the question, by the way, everyone was, what do you want? And, and, and you know, again, well, that's stupid. What do you mean, what do I want? But I have to tell you, I didn't have an answer. And, and it was actually days and weeks. And... Um, I, I really, what it did is, and I think you kind of alluded to this, it forced me to suddenly begin thinking, why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, a lot of us, got, I, I have found, and, and I think you pointed this out to the whole group when you met with us, we do things just because. 
right? We did, we just, this is the way we've always done it. We just, without thought. And, and, and when all of a sudden we had to say, well, what, 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 is, what is it that we want? What do we want this to look like? And everything from what do we want our day to look like? What do we want the firm to look like? What, what kind of clients do we want? And suddenly it be, you know, it really helped clarify. And, and what I wanted you, if you could explain a little bit to me, but to everyone listening, why is this so powerful? Um, what is it about it? And you say, again, you started to talk about this, 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 what, what is it about this that causes this sort of drastic rethink in, in organizations? Because I, I, I know it works. I'm still a little puzzled as to why. Mm, yeah. Well, a couple of things in there, you know, that, that question, right? Um, that question I asked you and you're like, I know, I, I, what are you talking about? I know the answer to that. And you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> so a funny thing is like, I don't get invited to a lot of parties because I tend to ask questions that leave people like, what the fuck? <laughs> 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 and, um, uh, but that aside, here's what's going on. Here's, here's what we've discovered. And, you know, I talked about the genesis of Fathom, but there's something else that I haven't mentioned. That's, that's been the thing. What, what we've discovered in our 15 years is the ultimate catalyst to accelerating an or organization's growth. It's a thing that we didn't expect. Well, we had a hunch, but weren't sure. Is maybe something we don't often consider. The more we elevate the humanity inside of an organization, the faster it grows. The more thoughtfully it grows. The more intentionally it grows. And the more effect it has in a positive way on its community through that growth. Here's what I mean. Because we're human, our wiring has us want to matter. It's just part of being human. Because we're human, um, our want to believe in a community of people around us, it's just part of our DNA. Because we're human, we wanna see a connection between what am I doing today and what difference is it making that matters to anyone, including myself. So if you think about it from that perspective, if we build an organization's architecture to satisfy those human concerns, then you could expect more of the humanity of that organization to be at work, right? The more impassioned, engaged, um, the more energy and resource that the human beings that are part of that organization are willing to contribute if it embodies those characteristics. So that what's happening and why this is working and it's such, a, it's such an interesting thing is what we do is we take these big human ideas, ideas about beliefs and commitments and values and we help bring those to the surface of an organization, not, not plug them in from somebody else's company, but find the ones that are already there, bring those to the surface and we put them at the center of the organization's design so that every decision, every action, every conversation is centered on those ideas. When they become that way, then that organization is up to something bigger than what it sells and what it makes, tends to do things that their competitors don't do, tends to create value where value didn't exist before. And they tend to be a hell of a lot happier and prosperous than their peers as a result. And there's real science behind this. We've just figured out how to actually turn this into something an organization can take on uh, and have that level of transformative uh, growth happen at a very accelerated rate. Do you get, do you find that you deal with folks who push back? Yeah. Because, be, well, because I will, I will tell you, there was a part of me that wanted to be like, L -l -l stop. I, I don't, I don't want to get into, I just want you to fix this problem. Right. That's, yeah, but with, yeah. Without addressing all this other stuff. It's almost like the person that goes to the, the, the psychiatrist and says, I have this issue. I don't want to talk about all of my background and what may be causing this. I just want you to fix this. And, yep. and it's not really the way that it works. Um, so I'm curious, have you had organizations and, and, and or owners and or em employers push back about this? So I'll, I'll put it in two categories. One would be there's definitely um, a condition within certain organizations that would um, have us not have any effect on them. And that, and that main condition is that they are so satisfied that they know what they're doing that they're unwilling to be contributed to. If that condition exists, that's our first, uh, that's the first thing we look to discover. If that condition exists, we walk away as quickly as possible. Because what's the point? If they already know what they're doing and they're satisfied, 
um, there's no, they're impenetrable. There's nothing we could bring to the table that's going to change anything. And I wish them luck. Well, well, <laughs> we well no, and, no, and, and what I think you're, <laughs> I think you're saying, because I've, I've had this too, where they are so convinced that what they're doing is right. They're not going to listen. Well, yeah. You know, well, and because um, there are organizations where it's like, look, we're doing great, but I think we, you know, how do we take it to the next level? How do we go better, you know, further? And they bring you in because they want you to come in and assess yep. and do stuff. And then there are people who I find usually are not doing so great, but they don't want to hear about it. Yep. And yeah, and, yeah no, I, I, I do get that. Um, it's hard to help. Hard to, it's hard to be there and be a partner for someone that isn't interested in listening. <laughs> well, no, um, and and, and yeah. people people that really I think would do best are folks that are open minded, saying, "Look, I I, I want to least if nothing else, I want to look at this. I want I want some feedback, things I'm not thinking about, um, hmm. because the truth is, if you're standing still, you're actually falling behind." That's Everything right. today, yeah. which, which I think, by the way, is what's frightening to so many Americans um, that because of technology, because of change, it happens so rapidly that you, you, the pressure really is on to, to keep, keep your skills, keep your knowledge, keep moving forward because it's like, it's like being on a conveyor belt. If you stand still, you're, you're actually sliding backwards. Um, but another thing I want to talk to you about, which again, I found eye-opening when we did this, is when we talked about tax rep. Mm. And I was talking about tweaking and doing and whatever, because again, to me, I was thinking branding. And you, same thing, ask the question, well, what is it that your tax rep members want? And I started to tell you, well, I assume, and you were like, whoa, 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 time out. <laughs> Wrong answer. Let's not assume anything. What what is it that, that, that they want? Why don't you know? And I was like, I don't know. You know? <laughs> um, and so what we ended up doing, and for those tax rep members who are listening to this will remember this, we ended up, you, we developed with you guys, we developed a survey that went out. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I was very blown away by what, the feedback because what I had assumed the members had joined for was not at all why they joined. Um, yep. And also not at all why, you know, we haven't had many leave, but the few that did, why they left. Um, um, and it, it, was, um, it, was, it, was, it was very mind-blowing to me. Um, and so a lot of the changes we've made, um, monthly Q&A calls, uh, the forum, um, all kinds of stuff that we've done, really was a result of that because I did, I kind of, like you said, I used the bad, the bad word. I assumed I knew what they wanted. Um, mm -hmm. So with that, with all of this, you know, for, for background for the folks listening. So when you come in Brent to a group, an organization, kind of where do you begin? I mean, how do you get started? Yeah. So, you know, I want to go back to the, the, the thing we were talking about before around, you know, is there pushback? Because there's, there's something important to know. So we talked about, look, there's some organizations that are impenetrable because they're not interested in being contributed to. But then there are a lot of organizations that are looking to get fixed. We got a problem that needs to be fixed. And, and that tends to be, um, I would say, you know, the mainstream reflex of an organization is that I have a problem that needs to be fixed. And no wonder, right? Because when you look at like as business leaders, what is it that we, what's most prevalent when we think about um, how it is we lead and navigate our organizations? You know, the mainstream tools that are available to us, the books we read, all these things, they all talk about it. You got a problem, here's how to fix it. Here's the best practices around this, and here's a proven methodology for that, and all these kinds of things. So we've been trained into this whole mindset that the only way to move forward is to fix our way. And I look at it this way, you cannot, and, and look, the math shows it to be true. You cannot fix your way to a future. You can only fix your way to more of what you've already got. Right. The only way to get to a future is to create it. And so what, for a lot of leaders, there's this whole other category of ways of bringing your organization forward that we don't often talk about. And that's where Fathom really focuses, which is, is it's not about something being wrong that needs to be fixed. It's about what's missing that needs to be created. 
And when we take that mindset, it's much more curious. It's much more creative. It's much more compassionate, meaning we don't put people in a defensive position. But, hey, what's wrong? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with the system? And we try to find blame. It becomes a place where we can start to create things. And, and it's interesting. What I find is I find a lot of companies who in a very early stage when they get started with us, one of the first things we do is we help them create a very clear picture of the future they want so that they then can think through that future and begin to see their organization in a whole new way. And what always happens is these things that they were busy putting time and effort into fixing, most of them weren't even relevant to the future they wanted. So if they didn't actually go through the exercise of getting really clear about what future they wanted and why, they would have spent all their time and energy fixing these things that were irrelevant anyway. And that's the kind of cycle that a lot of organizations get in. And so that concept you're talking about, Eric, that you know, we feel like, hey, we got to keep moving, got to keep moving, got to stay busy, got to stay busy. I look at it differently and say, we need to make sure we're applying energy for it makes the biggest difference. And I think what happened with um, that sort of opened your eyes when we conducted that assessment amongst your members was you were doing a whole lot of things and you were really, really busy doing it and you had no idea which of them made the difference. And what right. we did is said, instead of assuming, let's find out. And it wasn't just like, hey, what do you want? We asked them more about how you, would you become more valuable? What, what would be there that isn't there today that might change things even more for you? We asked different kinds of questions, not just direct like, what do you want? And what it did is it gave you a clear picture of what is it that they're seeing that's most valuable? What is it they're seeing that doesn't matter? And what is it that they hope for that might even make that experience a richer one? than it already is. So now, instead of you being busier, you could be laser focused on just the things that mattered that that team saw was most important. Now, that's a really great example that we did is with an external audience, that assumption thing. Let yeah. me tell you, the assumption thing is even worse when it comes to internal. A lot of leaders assume they know what it's like for their team. And they make these grand assumptions or categorize populations of human beings, and they don't have a realistic idea of what the the experience and reality of that employee is within the company. There's a great line, and I'll, I'll pause here, there's a great line in this book, uh, The Three Laws of Performance. Everyone's behavior is perfectly designed based on how the organization occurs to them. So there's maybe not, not anything wrong with them. Maybe there's something wrong with how the organization occurs to them, or maybe there's something missing that has the organization occur to them in a way that their behavior isn't exactly what you're looking for. You know, well, it, 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 well, there are a couple things I want to say. It, it, it's, what's fascinating about that, it's that point you just made really is being driven home because of the generational. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what people assume millennials want, I, I was just reading this not too long ago, I think it was the Wall Street Journal, they were talking about in surveys, <laughs> the millennials don't want anything <laughs> that the companies thought that they wanted. And, and, and you know, that whole sort of, you know, the, the assumption pro problem is a big problem. I mean, for me, for tax rep, you may recall, I assumed, and I told you this, they want access to me. They want more access to me more. And that actually was, um, was not. What really came out was it, was, it almost didn't even have to be me. What they really wanted more help was marketing. What they really wanted more help was, you know, and things that I wasn't, you're right, I wasn't focused on at all. I was too busy doing all this other stuff. Um, and I, I have to tell you, as we've shifted and even brought in other people to help bring more marketing ideas to the table, help the members, this, um, it just keeps growing and growing. And it, it, but I, I didn't know. I, I, I made, I did what exactly what you said. I assumed, right? I made my assumption, and that's what I was running with, and never bothered actually asking the people, <laughs> the members, mm. gee, what would it is it that you would like, uh, or what is it that's working for you or not working for you? Um, it, it was, it was, it was eye opening. Um, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Go Eric, on. What you're talking about is that. You know, for a lot of uh, for a lot of leaders, um, they're acting on and making decisions on uh, big communities. Could be customers, could be employees, whatever it is. Um, out of relationship with them. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually out of relationship, but I'm acting and have and and making investments that have a huge influence on that community, and that's dangerous. Yep. 
No, it, it is uh, both business as well as uh, even larger uh, whole communities when you don't know what, what, what actually the need is and what's going on. So, you know, on that note, you deal with so many different companies, large accounting firms, law firms, um, uh, architects and, 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 and marketing companies. Um, you know, how much of a challenge is it for you for each company or, or do you, I guess what I'm really trying to ask is, do you find very common themes running through whether it's a law firm, architect, accounting firm, whatever, or, or, or do you find that it, each of these niches really is, is very different? You know, I think that the biggest, look, there's different business models, there's different ways money flows through organizations, there are different products and services, and there's certainly different, you know, credentials and expertise. But, but fundamentally, um, you know, because we're dealing with human beings, the, the conditions that are most prevalent and the symptoms of those conditions, they're pretty common. It's to what degree are they present and which ones actually matter most. That's, that's the difference. The other thing that's different from organization to organization is the, um, the, the semantics. You know, every company has its own language, um, often built around acronyms and slang and different phrases. And so that's something that, you know, we're not so concerned about what an organization does. We're more concerned about what it could be. Um, and so we need to have mastery of the language and the semantics, but we can stay objective and remove ourselves from the reality of that organization so we can actually see it for what it is. And we can um, call out things that are obvious to us being objective outsiders that the organizational leaders can't see themselves. You know, this, my, uh, one of my mentors always uses the phrase, you can't read the label from inside the bottle. That's why you need somebody that can see you. <laughs> yeah. And that's what, we, that's what we are for our clients. I mean, we work with churches and nonprofit organizations. I mean, it's just the, the spectrum is, is pretty interesting. One thing I'll say, that, well, there's kind of like five things that we seek to cause within any of the organizations we work with. Um, the first thing is, is we want to help bring into existence what we call an inspiring narrative. What, is the, what are the ideas, the, you know, the beliefs and the commitments and the values that are going to be the vocabulary that organization is going to use to drive itself forward? Um, a second condition that we're looking to cause is, a, is courageous leadership. You know, these are leadership, uh, this is leadership that's well equipped to, um, you know, act in the unknown, to be decisive, um, to... Um, make things that would be okay, not okay, because it's hurting people. That's courage. Um, we look to create um, this concept of enrolled teams, meaning every member of that organization feels a connection to and the ability to contribute to the future of that organization, not just do their job. Uh, the fourth category is celebrated measurement. How do we understand and measure our progress moving forward and rigorously celebrate it? That I can't tell you how many organizations don't do that very well. And so how can you know what kind of progress you're making? And then the last one is, is compelling invitations. You know, how compelling are the invitations you're extending for an employee to join you or for a client to want to hire you? If those haven't changed in a while and you're seeing the side effects of it, like commoditization or trouble getting talent, it's time to relook at, well, how compelling are those invitations and what's the experience going to be like of us when they get here? Um, I'm curious, um, not to get too far off script, but, uh, but, um, or off topic, but are you finding because of the rate of disruption now happening across like literally every industry, are you finding more companies looking for your the kind of help that you bring, or do you still find? My sense is that a lot of people don't even realize they've got the problem. These problems, mm, um, yeah. uh, but uh, have you noticed anything over the last number of years that would give you an indication that that more companies are recognizing they've got they've got either this problem or a problem uh, as an organization, or do you find it still more like me? Brought, brought you in to think, hey, look, I want this fix. And instead, what it opens up is this, you know, hey, wait a minute, we, we've got, you know, we've got bigger questions here. Yeah, yeah. I, here's what I'd say I've seen shift. Because when, when we first really started taking this on, 
it, it was it was not easy because it was really like, what are you talking about? Future design? What the heck is that? Like, just give me some continuous improvement over here, right? Now just give me some yeah. Six Sigma. Let's take care of this problem. Um, so that was tough. But here's what I've seen is, is I think that we're at a time now where leaders have realized that the tools that they've been using just aren't adequate anymore. They're not adequate because they're not aiming at or designed to deal with the conditions that we're in right now. Those conditions certainly include the pace of change, but they also include the fact that we're dealing with the first time ever in history, five generations in the workforce, a time where we are connected um, and can see the effects of our actions globally in real time, um, that we have planetary influence um, based on the size and capacity of the um, human species. There's major things going on um, the fact that, you know, I can't remember, I think we're somewhere in the order of 8 billion sensors are walking around the planet right now, based on the fact that the average phone has like 13 sensors in it, plugged into the internet real time. Like we, we have a digital twin of ourselves in social media. We have digital twin in manufacturing now. I mean, it's just this, we're in this time we've never seen. Um, so the tools of the, that we've been using, they're just not adequate anymore. And so what that's opening up is questions to say, well, what else is out there? Well, guess what? You know, people are getting uh, a whiff of what Fathom's up to, and there's a lot of attention uh, coming our way as a result. Well, and, and you know, it's a great segue because I did want to mention to people, um, and unfortunately, I don't think they're online, so they're only local. But you run these these very cool events um, referred to as SIP sessions, um, and I, I wanted to, I was going to ask you, do you mind explaining to the listeners like what those are? Um, and I'm going to get to how the people can contact you in a little bit, but um, what is a SIP session? So SIP sessions, I'll just give you a quick, you know, how they began. SIP sessions were, were really an experimental idea. I was kind of interested to see, is there a community of human beings out there that walk around with a rock in their shoe, that are dissatisfied with the status quo, want to take more responsibility for themselves and the influence that they have on the world, and so we, you know, one afternoon, I'm like, hey, we're going to talk about future design. Anyone want to come? And like 10 people showed up and we had this really wonderful conversation. And, um, and then I'm like, hey, let's do it again. And the next thing, you know, we were kind of doing this thing fairly regularly. And we had, you know, 10, 20, 30 people show up. And then I started inviting guests. And, um, and it just kept going on and on and on. So we're now 60 SIP sessions in. We've had th uh, thousands of people come to these things. We host them every single month, the middle Wednesday of every month. And what they become is they become this sort of guided interchanges of ideas and experiences and beverages. <laughs> and it's all about provoking our innate ability to create the future we wanna live into. And so it's not about a TED talk, it's the antithesis of a TED talk. People come, they have an experience. So for example, you know, a couple of sessions ago, we talked about and played with this notion that, you know, we have these unconscious and conscious biases that have us rank the value of human life. What's that about? Are we even aware of them? And, it, and we took it on and, and did some experiments to, to show that, oh my gosh, yeah, <laughs> there's some crazy things going on here. We um, talked about the power of no and how is it that you can use no as the opportunity to say yes to things that matter more. Um, the last one we did was about, um, you know, how to be selfish at the beginning of the day so you can be selfless uh, for the rest of the day. And how is it that you can put yourself in a position where you're using your energy for the best possible purposes of elevating others and elevating yourself. Um, so this is the kind of stuff we take on. And it's been great uh, because it's just taken off. And we have 15 of them in 2020 alone. But we're starting to get notice. Like Connecticut Magazine ran a big story on it uh, last year. We just got nominated as a finalist for the Connecticut Entrepreneurial Awards. We're being nominated for a couple of other things. But it's open to the community. It's free. Um, and it's two hours of doing something meaningful, not sitting at home watching Netflix. Time well spent. Yeah. No, uh, I, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, and... Um, I will, you know, actually my, so my next, my next thing, Brent, you know, before I ask my last question would be how do the listeners, uh, and I'm thinking I'll, I'll put a, a connection down there to the, you, you know, your SIP sessions as well. How do our listeners who want to get a hold of you, who are like Eric Green, who have issues, um, 
in their practice and their, you know, their business, whatnot, how do they, how, how can they find you and get a hold of you? Well, first off, there's no one quite like you, Eric. <laughs> better for better or worse, <laughs> and I mean that, in, and I mean that in the warmest possible way. You're, you are, uh, you are some, you are something else, my friend. Um, <laughs> the best, honestly, Google my name, uh, Brent Robertson. Uh, if you do that, you will find me on LinkedIn, Facebook. You'll find the Fathom.net website. Um, you know, I'm on all kinds of digital media, so best way to reach out to me. Right, right, and, I, and I'll put a bunch of those links in the description for folks. Um, and, um, and, uh, it's not, again, something to the SIP sessions, which if you are local and can make one of those sessions, they are fascinating and, and the topics vary. I mean, some of, some of them, uh, I, I've managed to make others. I, I can't because you do tend to move around, but, um, uh, they, they really are fascinating and, and, and thought, um, you know, thought provoking. Um, so Brent, my final question for those people listening to this, which I kind of already alluded to who are like me, right? So they're sitting there, you know, I'm struggling with, you know, I, I'm, I'm really struggling with fill in the blank, right? Uh, uh, attracting new clients, attracting the right type of people uh, for clients. By the way, um, attracting mentors, attracting, mm. you know, the, these things, these these things that people we, that we need in our life. Um, I, my business is not running properly. I, we don't know what we, we don't know what we want, whatever it is, you know, fill in the blank. Um, these, these issues can be fixed. You've taught me that, that you, the, there's nothing that can't be fixed. It might be completely rethought. Mm. How would you advise those folks to get started because I have to tell you that that is one of the things I find is, and, and, and I, I should have asked this before. Do you find that people tend to end up going, they get hung up or they, they go to a dark place where, uh, because I was, I, I was like, if everything is so mm, great, why yeah. am I so unhappy? Um, yeah. but, so for those folks listening to this is the last thing, what would you advise them? Like, where do you begin? Because sometimes you get so caught, it's like you get so caught up in the forest, you can't see the trees, right? Um, you get so caught up in the trees, I think you can't see the forest. So um, what would your advice be to those folks who are, who are listening to this and like, oh my God, that's me? Well, here's the ray of hope. The ray of hope is this, that transformation is really only possible when the current condition becomes intolerable. I mean, you just can't take it anymore. And, and when I say that, I don't mean it just in a negative way. It could be like, I just, these conditions, I am suffering, I'm burning out. I can't take it anymore. Something's got to change. The other would be, I've got this ambition. It's haunting me and I can't seem to figure out how to get access to it. That's the same thing. I mean, that's a, that's a really wonderful thing that's going on, but it feels the same. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm like, that is, that's really the wake up call. So if that's happening to you, that means transformation is around the corner if you can um, do this one really important thing is get curious <laughs> every leader the best advice i can give them is get curious when something's showing up that you that doesn't that doesn't resonate with you you see a pattern of behavior in your organization you see a thing going on get curious about it start looking at it asking it questions asking people questions you know one of the things that we talk about like employee engagement this is a quick little exercise you can do right now is, you know, if you're struggling with employee engagement, you're struggling with, you know, why aren't people staying or why aren't people coming to my company? What you could do is this little exercise. Ask yourself, you know, what would be the story I would love somebody who works here um, telling at the dinner table when they go home at night? What would be the story you would love for them to say about their day at your company? For you, that would be like, man, that would be awesome. Like they went home and they gathered their family around, they're having dinner, and this is the story they shared about their day. What would be in that story? What, what would be the narrative? Get that written down, write down on the attributes of it. And then do this other thing. Find out what are the stories being told now? What's the story of the experience of your organization right now? Ask your people. You might find it's quite far away from the story you want it to be, but then at least you know what you have to work with. When we make assumptions, when we just react, oh, there's something wrong with them. They should, should they be happy? I pay them, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. If you hold on to that story, it's, uh, it's already a dead end. If you get curious, 
and say, I wonder what's going on. I wonder what's reality for my people. I wonder what's reality for my clients. All that does is it gives you opportunity to make choices, become aware, and to do something about it. So get curious when things get dark. Get curious when um, you're wondering why it's not turning out. Get curious when you're seeking to realize some potential and you're struggling with it. And get help. You know, there's folks like us out there. We can see things you can't see because we're outside of your organization. And we can help you put energy where it matters most. There is, there is help out there. As I, can, as I can attest to. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now, listen, uh, Brent, uh, you know, thank you for, for coming on. Thank you for doing this. Uh, it, it, I mean, everything has been, you know, and by the way, if you're listening, I, I text Brent all the time. Hey, you know, can we talk about this? Uh, it's, it's, it, it's not a, um, hey, you know, now, now we've met with you, you're fixed, go on. It's, I'm finding that the asking questions and being curious leads me to the next thing. And what, what is the next, what, how do, you know what, honestly, how do we get to the next best version of us, me, the firm? How do I get other people to the next best version of themselves? Um, it, it's an ongoing, it's a, it's, a, it's a journey that doesn't end. Mm. Um, well, you can choose to make it end, but then it's pretty boring. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, um, so listen, uh, Brent, thank you for joining me. For everyone, I will put in the description how you can uh, get a hold of Brent. Um, he has been extremely helpful, not just to other organizations. I can attest to our own, both the law firm as well as the tax rep community. And um, with that, thank you for listening. Brent, again, thank you for doing this. I appreciate your coming on and taking the time. Thanks, Eric. My pleasure. All right. Listen, everyone, thank you for listening in and uh, catch you on the next episode. Bye-bye. Hey, guys, listen, thank you for listening into this week's podcast. We only have sponsors on the program that we ourselves use, all right? Tax Help Software. It is the cornerstone of our practice. It's how we get our transcripts, calculate our CSED dates. It's how I get my updates every day from intelligent ordering, right? We have special offers from Tax Help Software. If you are a listener, go out to www.taxhelpsoftware.com, put in tax rep trial, all capitals, one word. You'll get a free two-week trial to try it for yourself and, and to see how amazing it is. Want to get it? Tax rep 10 will get you 10% off. Hey, so what do we use in our practice? What do I have my clients using as far as receipts and audit proofing? Receipt bank. All right. I discovered Receipt Bank when one of my clients had their records destroyed and, been, and were selected for audit. And during the reconstruction, of course, the forensic accountant we were working with said, why aren't you using Receipt Bank? Of course, I'm thinking, why aren't we using Receipt Bank? And given how much traveling I do, whatever it is, uh, the Starbucks coffee, the breakfast at the hotel before I go speak, whatever, I take a shot of it. It goes right into QuickBooks. Our controller now has a picture of it. I can eat the receipt, lose it, burn it, doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter if that magnetic stuff fades. We will have that forever. And that's how you audit proof. Go check out Receipt Bank and get your clients using it. Trust me, they're gonna appreciate it when the audit letter comes. Finally, how is it that we get through to the government in under three minutes? I've talked about getting through in 30 seconds. Call ENQ the most amazing service ever. Now, if you get tax help software, it's built in and you can sign up that way. But otherwise, you can just use it and dial in. You will get through to the government, I'm telling you, in under three minutes, generally in under 30 seconds. All right, we have a special offer for all of our tax rep listeners. Click on the link in the description, go out, you can get 200 minutes for $20. I'm telling you, it will change the way you interact with the IRS. We calculated at Green and Scars, we think we're going to cut about 50,000 of billable time off just by using ENQ, all right? And again, we did a podcast episode on this, Dialing for Dollars. Go listen to it if you want more information, but you click on that link, try it. I'm telling you, it will change your practice. So guys, thanks for listening. And again, check out the sponsors. It's what we use. We think they're awesome. Keep building your practices. Bye-bye.